Hey guys, I'm going to re-record the lecture on construction for you here. This is actually, well, no one will care, but um, you've already heard this lecture. Just giving it to you in case it helps for your review for exam two, which is next week. So you'll have all three of the lectures pertaining to that exam and zero excuses to not get an A. So without further ado, um, let's go over here. <clears throat> PowerPoint. There we go. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, we're going to talk about... Not that. We're going to talk about that. Structured cabling and network elements. And a little more on structured cabling in a second. It really is just a term to describe a set of standards. So, we want to identify the best practices. You work in IT, you're going to hear best practice all the time. It's probably in other industries, but it's everywhere in ours. There's what you've been doing that's not good enough then there's what you know you should be doing that's best practices like when we install something at john a logan or at siu we have to think about um the siu or john a's regulations then we think about state of illinois regulations pertaining to schools then maybe there's federal regulations we have to worry about and that gets us up to the minimum standard we have to use to be legally compliant with how we're building a network or how we're setting up a room. And then there's best practices. Now, ideally, you're always setting up best practice. Best practice means you did the best you could in every possible way. You used the best equipment, you set it up the best, you bought the best software, and it's going to function perfectly, as well as it possibly can. Um, best practice is also like a security thing. We're being as safe as we can. Our computers are encrypted. Our network is firewalled. We have external people VPN in. We are using the best practice for security. So you'll hear that term all the time. In this segment, we talked about issues relating to power because IT engineers, network engineers, sysadmins, stuff like that, you have to think about it. When SIU installed its esports facility, we didn't think about power at all. We just bought 12. $2,500 Alienware computers that were going to be used by a few educational programs and then be like video game machines and be used by the esports group. And uh, we thought, oh, we'll have a tournament at Comic Con with them. So we did that. And the moment we set them up, turned them on, they worked fine. They would go to the desktop. And then as soon as 12 people sat down and all launched Overwatch and every one of those computers 1080 Ti kicked on, their power consumption went up. And we blew out, we blew the breakers for the southern third of the student center. Like we took out the power to the food court, the lights went out, uh, people were annoyed. So you got to think about power. Other local environmental issues, um, of course, that's going to matter moisture, heat, cool, whatever. Uh, fungus, rodents, thinking about raccoons right now during the quarantine because there's a raccoon who thinks he's going to quarantine in my chimney not not cool with it so we're going to talk about some interfaces and create a network map that part's essential more on that later so the tia eia eieio joint 568 commercial building wiring standard better known as structured cabling says this is the sort of cable you should use it should be at least this good this tough able to stand this withstand this much heat and be moisture resistant it sort of just says, hey, everybody, let's all use cable at least this good. So um, applies pretty much no matter what you're doing. And it's a good thing to guide yourself by. So your components. First thing we want to talk about is an entrance facility. If you get hired by a whatever, uh, a new a new Panera is coming into town and they say, hey, uh, get us some local Internet hooked up for our office you're going to need an entrance facility. This is where the external internet comes into the building. You're going to have main distro frames and then int uh, intermediate distribution frames to share that internet out to the rest of the building. Okay. A horizontal and backbone wiring. Let's look at a map here. Ah, first of all, even if you have three buildings, wherever the internet first reaches your campus, say John A. Logan, for example, Whichever building the internet comes in to, I don't know which one it is, there is a main distribution frame. 
and the distribution frame then uses backbones, what we call backbones, to connect the other buildings. Okay, and then when it hits the other building, we call it an intermediate distribution frame. Okay, this is just the terms we use for this stuff. Let's look at vertical, horizontal. Horizontal wiring basically means the last segment that is going to the computer or the device that's going to use it. When you're in the 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 distribution frame, you are kind of talking about typically um, vertical wiring. Like right here, this picture, you're looking at like the space between walls. I don't know if this map that's intended to be like a a sub wall some sort of um, just space between the walls left in the building and they decided to put the wiring equipment in there or maybe they built it um, specifically to hold all the wiring and the switches and maybe even servers and stuff as long as it's climate controlled that would be fine so then when you run it out through the ceiling through the floor or however you get it there that's when we call it horizontal wiring okay we have to remember our limits ethernet just kind of starts to not work very well past 300 feet 90 meters 100 meters and this is kind of the way we split that up you figure in the room you're going to have maybe up to 10 meters you have to run the cable to the person's computer uh, if you have to run the cable around the room in a weird way and that means you can only have 90 meters from the wall jack that that computer is connecting to to the wiring closet to the data closet okay so these little patch panels connect the main distro frame to your um, punch block that has all your wall jacks. This is, these are just the terms for the box. Basically, a punch block is where all the computer's Ethernet jacks connect to. Then it connects to the MDF, and that's it. These are just words for various, you guys know what they are. They're uh, basically switches and cable connectors. And then the last segment to the computer, we call that a patch cable. Uh, most regular folk call it an Ethernet cable, but network nerds will always in my experience, call it a patch cable. Remember to use the right lingo or you sound like a dum-dum. So types of cable. There's unshielded. They're all basically, these. the first two are here are twisted pair, meaning they're uh, eight pair, or four pairs, so eight wires total, and a plastic sheath around those metal wires. Now shielded has an extra layer. It has this metal sheath around the wires, just inside the plastic tube layer, and that protects it. It keeps any EMS, electromagnetic um, signals, from leaving the cable and hitting another cable, and it prevents any signals from coming into the cable. EMS will ruin your performance or disable your network if it's severe enough. Typically, it's a performance issue. You're like, oh, why is this Ethernet cable running at 60 to 70% of its maximum throughput? It's probably interference. Should have used better cable, or maybe you could rearrange things and fix it. So unshielded, that's going to be for patch cables. That's horizontal wiring, that last segment. In a computer lab, none of the computers are close enough that their Ethernet cables could possibly interfere with each other. So you can use unshielded there. Fiber optic doesn't have this problem. It's not communicating in electric signals. It's shooting beams of you know light through a tube filled with mirrors. It is a gross oversimplification, but you guys, uh, you know, I give you a lot of those. So cable management in your wiring closet, in your punch blocks, in your in in the way you arrange wall jacks, and the way you run patch cables in a room, should be clean, should be organized, should be sensible. Someone else should be able to walk in after the fact and understand what you've done. You don't want to kink the cables, bend them, squish them, crush them. I mean, it's a metal cable in there. You bend it enough, it'll break, then you don't have a connection anymore. You're definitely going to want a cable test. All your cables. Um, trying to think of the last time I had to make a ton of cables at once. One time I had to make 40 cables at once, and I tested the first 10, and I screwed up the first one, and then I did nine in a row right, and I quit testing. And I, I did, by the time I was done, I had done 39 in a row without screwing up. Um, but I always, I always screw up the first one. So definitely test until you're super confident, 100% confident that you're not making any mistakes. Otherwise, you're going to install a faulty cable and then have to find it later. But we will discuss how you find that stuff. So, remember the maximum length? Yeah, let's move on. Cable management. Yeah, I mean, don't lay cables across the floor where people could trip over them. 
use a cord cover. That's why you see those in offices, because once upon a time, someone just ran an Ethernet cable through an office. Another person tripped over it and ripped the Ethernet cable out of the wall, probably breaking it out of the connector and just, you know, breaking it. And I'm sure we only had to learn that lesson once. We never did it again. <clears throat> so, again, the way you arrange should take into account electromagnetic in electromagnetic interference. Sorry, I haven't had quite enough coffee today. Okay, pay attention to your rating, grounding requirements. Yep, always leave some slack at both ends. That's super helpful. If you ever do have an end cap broken or you have to recut a cable for some reason, you want to have uh, like a couple feet of slack at each end. It looks sloppier in your little box, but you can wind it up. You can uh, twisty tie it or something. Um, and you'll be glad to have it if you ever have to change or adjust anything on that cable. So specify the standards used by your organization. Write them down somewhere. Leave them in documentation accessible to the owners and managers and other people at the company in case they ever have any questions about it or ask any questions. Definitely share that documentation with your legal department. Label everything. Label everything. Label everything. Color-coded cables help. Mm, update your documentation when you make changes. These are all just sensible little checklists that you should have when you're building or redesigning or, you know, revamping a network. You don't want your cable next to, right next to, power lines. The EMS will be very strong. Motors actually cause a bit of EMS and microwaves. I think microwaves are better insulated these days. They might not do that so much anymore, but it used to be an issue. If you ran your cables right next to it, it was an issue. So cable plenum rating is the sort of industry standard thing. And it describes what's kind of in the plastic around the jacket. Uh, is it low smoke PVC? Does it hinder flame? Does it not release smoke? Is it good? Now the reason we think about smoke is because whenever you build anything in a building, the contractors will tell you this too. If you build something in a building, you think about fire, you think about flood, you think about disaster, and you might even think about raccoons. I should have, because this happened before. Now it's happening again. I'm not going to get off on that tangent. Okay, so think about fire. If your building burns down and people are stuck in there for a bit, smoke inhalation is a deadly thing. It's very bad for humans. And if your cable emits just heinous, noxious, poison smoke, you know, the plastic just turns into a dangerous gas for people's lungs in the air, then essentially your network that you built is going to kill people if there's a fire, even if they escape the fire itself. So we put in cable that doesn't burn very well. Um, if it does get into a fire, it doesn't really produce smoke. It'll still melt. It's still ruined. Like, it's bad enough you're going to lose the equipment, but at least we're not going to hurt anybody with the choices we made when we built this network. Okay? So you got to think about that. Okay. Device management. Yeah, I'm going to say this like 20 times in this one. I'm sure you guys remember I did when we did it in class. Maintain up-to-date records because someone else will follow you or you will come back and it will have been a long time since you were there and you'll be really glad that you wrote down what you did and drew a map of it. Okay? Helps with troubleshooting. Helps with everything. It's just crucial. If you're going to build something, build it smart. Okay? That means documenting. Uh, I think we already had the cable tags. Yeah, it should be tagged. When you walk into a wiring closet, you should be able to tell what which wires go where this one goes down that hall this one goes to another switch this one goes to the mdf you should be able to figure it out especially if you have who, the map drawn by whoever built it uh labels are fun some people really uh get off on that around the around the workplace i know some accountants that um yeah they're they're like emotionally gratified by labeling things it's um it's a thing uh okay Mm. Yeah, the naming of ports. You develop an, a naming system, like, oh, I'm going to start counting at zero, I'm going to start counting at one, or whatever, and you stick to it. That's important. This room, I threw in this picture because this is an example of a slightly messy room. 
it's just kind of hanging everywhere. The cables are hanging slack off the back of the various rack mounted whatevers. Servers, switches, there's a blue wire just sort of uh, dangling in the middle here. That's not good. Don't do that. Tie up your stuff, okay? Um, this is a room full of rack mounts. These are supposed to make this room more organized. They're supposed to save you space and provide good ventilation. And they are doing that. It's just the cable management that seems to be a problem in that particular picture. Here's a better one. See? Looks good. Color-coded, super organized. Nothing's hanging loose or slack. It's all the excess cable has been tied up, hidden somewhere. Very sneaky. Looks like the inside of a custom-built PC. Very clean. Okay? Now, cooling a room like this is important. If you're going to, you know, one computer can get hot if you're using it a lot or you're playing a game on it or you're stressing it in some way. Imagine 50 of them in a six foot tall box. They're all going to generate some heat. Racks, rack computers and rack servers generate less heat than a desktop. They don't have to power a monitor usually. They don't have a big graphics card. They're just like a power supply, a drive, and, you know, motherboard RAM processor. They're, they're as minimal as they can be, but they still make heat. So the way you do this, if you have a whole room full of, of racks, is you, you say this row is the cold row and the next one's the hot row and you face all the servers in one row the same direction so that they are pulling in cold air on one side and uh, same aisle like this aisle's cold the servers push the hot air out the back and then you put a um, hot air like return above here I have a better picture of it rather than just fail to explain it continually so in this system Here's your air conditioner over here, this big blue dude, right? You're pumping that cold air through the floor, in this case. It comes up through the floor, and the server cabinet sucks it up. The, all the servers have fans that pull air from the front to the back. So they suck up this cool air, use it, they heat it up, and then out the back of the rack, with another back of a, a different rack in the same spot, all that hot air. So this aisle... A human being could walk down this one and feel cool and walk down this one and start sweating. There'll be that much difference. And then you have the hot air return, you run it back through the AC, done. Brilliant system. Uh, monitoring also. Most of these servers have monitoring systems. Um, I'm trying to remember last year when we did the Wi-Fi router setup and we set up routers in the lab at John A. It was amazing. I was actually very impressed at how quickly network control jumped on us. And it's because they had monitoring systems in place. We set up those routers. Someone connected the router to the wall jack. And our John A. Logan network nerds got a text or an email or a ping or something and said there is a rogue router on the network and you need to do something. And then they looked what room it was and realized that it was Rob Craig. And they were like, oh, of course, typical. Um, they called Rob Craig, and he called me and told me to quit it, and problem solved. Okay? I'll get a good look at that guy. The other thing you're going to want to build in here is an emergency thing. Like, oh, my server's down. It's not responding. I can't remote control it. I forgot the password. Um, or we're being hacked or something. I need to just directly access the computer without any kind of network connected to it. It looks like a laptop. It's actually like a KVM switch kind of thing. It's just a monitor, keyboard, mouse, like a trackpad. And you can use the KVM to connect it to any one of the servers in the rack. This is super handy. You're like, oh, server three is down. Pull out the little monitoring guy and hit three on the KVM. And you should be looking at that, that server's screen and have a mouse and keyboard to it. Perfect. The other thing that might be in your rack system is a NAS, network attached storage. This is more than just a little external hard drive or more than a file server because it is designed to have multiple hard drives in it. Your typical NAS is going to have two, three, four, eight hard drives and what the NAS does for you is it manages them. It looks like it's one big file system. It's actually a bunch of drives together. One of them dies, it's got the data on the others and it's like, oh, this one's dead. It'll even report to you. This drive's dead, but we're good. We have seven others that are still working, but you need to replace this drive. And you can just take it out, 
put in a different drive and you're good. It will figure it out. Very handy device. The SAN is a bunch of these working together. Or a bunch of other similar devices working together. So there's a bunch of different protocols they use. You don't have to go too in depth on that for this quiz. But just know that at a bigger organization, when they say, oh yeah, everything's on our file server, everything's on our Z drive, or whatever, they could be talking about a hundred devices across town in a server room. It could be a NOS. It could be a, a whole SAN of, of storage devices connected together. But it looks to the customer like it's one thing. It's Google Drive, you know, it's it's uh, Microsoft OneDrive, it's Dropbox. Feels like it's one thing, it's really not. Okay? So you can install this in separate location, very scalable. You can add more devices to it, more drives. You can expand storage basically to an unlimited extent. And it should be fast. You should make sure that it's got a good fast internet connection, that the equipment's strong enough to push the files back and forth. Um, if you work for somewhere that does video editing and moves a lot of big files back and forth, we have one department at SIU where they do weather simulation and their data is huge. Their computers are very powerful. And we were going to put them on the, the, the basically the sand for SIU. And it was too far across campus and took too long to copy their files because they're in class. And it's like, here you go, students. Here's 10 gigs of weather data. Now you're going to run a simulation based on that. And it had to be in the same room with them because it wasn't fast enough for their taste otherwise. So let's move on. Power. The thing about power is anticipating the lack of it. Anticipating disaster. You're going to plan for outages, fluctuations, bad days, mo big moods. You're going to you're going to think about all of it. Anything that might affect your equipment, anything that might cut your power. I was about to record this lecture an hour ago and we had a power failure and I'm just sort of waiting for it to happen again in this recording. So, power surges will blow stuff up. They'll actually just melt your cables they'll melt your gear they'll blow up they'll ruin computers they don't actually blow up like that old uh, <laughs> spam thing back in the 90s they emailed people and told them their computer was gonna explode if they didn't pay them money uh, great one of the early email scams it won't necessarily explode I have seen them catch fire before uh, doesn't happen often anymore so let's understand how this works a surge is a momentary increase. Could be lightning strikes, could be a lot of weird stuff. You have to plan for it. You gotta put in surge protectors. You gotta put in APCs and other things that essentially take the hit for you. Like they take one for the team. Lightning hits your house, your surge protectors get destroyed, that's them doing their job. And you you know, go take a hundred bucks and replace them all. But you don't have to replace your computer, your TV, your fridge, etc., because the surge protectors ate it. So noise <clears throat> is when there's, well, it's actually just sounds like um, it affects the signal in such a way that it looks like noise. I have a picture here in a second. I'm failing to explain it. But noise in your power line means that the device is not getting a consistent amount of electricity. And devices that use electricity like very much to get a consistent, predictable amount in the range that they are designed to take. And they don't like more or less. They act real bad um, if they get less and they get damaged if they take more. Brownout is uh, also called a, they also call it a sag. I've never heard anyone call it that, but I believe them. Brownout, it just, like it says, the lights dim for a second. Um, Maybe your computer monitor dims for a second and then comes back up to full. And you're like, whoa, did the lights just dim in here? All the lights will, of course, do it at once. So you'll be like, is it me or did it really happen? Blackouts wear their off completely. Brownouts, by the way, um, something they do on purpose. When the power companies, the power plant is struggling to make enough power, it's just like, oh, we need, um, you know, 100 mega gigaboogies of power and we only have 80 so we're going to brown out Cobden for an hour then we're going to brown out Carterville for an hour then we're going to brown out Carbondale for an hour so everyone will have power for three of the next four hours but no one will have it the whole time 
Luckily, we don't have to have that around here because Illinois has crap loads of nuclear plants and they generate butt loads of electricity. Crap load butt. Very nice. So UPS takes the concept of surge protector, adds a little smarter chip in there, a little mini computer to kind of manage it, and a battery. So the power can completely disappear and the UPS will keep powering your stuff. Um, it also acts as a balancer. It's a good thing to use around here. Um, yeah, standby continuous voltage switches to the battery. Yeah. Uh, online UPS is what you want when you have noise on the line, you have a lot of brownouts, you have inconsistent power, because whatever devices you connect to it, they'll never know how crappy their electricity is, because the UPS will always give them a nice steady amount. It like buffers, just like Netflix. It always makes sure that it's sending an even amount of power and it uses the battery to soak up more and make sure that it can continue that. So you got to think about how much power you need, how long you want it to be able to keep the device running in the event of a long power failure. You have to do the math here. The device uses this much, the, U the UPC holds this much, the UPS holds this much. Uh, line conditioning, yeah, I've covered that. Now, redundancy is like I've got a bunch of battery backups in place, or I've got a generator. My uh, neighbor right here, I can't believe she hasn't done it, but what she likes to do is test her generator. She has a generator connected to her house ever since the derecho came and knocked out our power for two weeks. And if there's a power failure, I hear everything in my house go silent. And within a second, just like, mm, like her generator kicks on and we, we hear it everywhere. It's very loud. It's a big diesel generator that's just set on a little trip switch. If the power goes out, turn on. So she has like a brownout and the rest of the neighborhood has a blackout. It's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, several times when I tried to record a lecture, she's decided to test it. She's a sweet lady though. Okay. Combine with the stuff. Yeah, obviously if you're going to have a generator, you better take care of it and make sure it's fully fueled. Otherwise, it's just not going to be any use when you have a problem. Um, clearly a slide I made late at night. Let's just uh, move along. But do take notice that the power plant sends everything down through transformers. There's, uh, again, called a main power distribution for the building. And the generator is off the side of it. So if this power plant just goes belly up and stops sending any electricity the generator is going to kick on and you're still going to have electricity. Okay, monitoring. If you're in charge of this stuff, you're responsible for it, you want to keep an eye on it. You want to keep an eye on all of it, including the heating and AC systems. So you're going to monitor, believe it or not, in your server room, you're going to think about the temperature and the humidity and where the air is flowing. Are the exhaust fans working? You're just going to care about every little detail because this equipment's so expensive and so elaborate to set up and it serves so many people once it's up and running. So many people will be mad at you if it goes down that you just can't risk that. So you take every possible precaution. Security too. So Nick is in every one of these devices. Every device has one. Um, we use Ethernet standards and NICs exist at layer 2. Yeah, by the way, we're transitioning into the NICs phase of the presentation. That was not a very smooth segment change there, sorry. Um, <clears throat> yeah, they convert the signal into data. I think we already kind of went over this largely. Um, yeah, they do a little prioritization. Smarter NICs do the newer, you know, gigabits. They're, they're smarter than the, the old 10 base T. Next, were nowhere near as um, capable as the ones are now, but yeah, I really think we covered this like two chapters ago. Probably don't need this here. Anyway, nowadays a NIC can mean a lot of things though. Like you're thinking of this little green card that goes inside your computer. Yeah, that's typically what we think of as a NIC, but this little Wi-Fi card is also a NIC. This little D-Link Ethernet adapter is also a NIC. There's like little USB Wi-Fi guys that you plug in the back of your computer and provide Wi-Fi. That's technically a NIC. It's got a MAC address. It provides internet in some way. And it's basically a stand-in for a regular old Ethernet cable and a Ethernet connection on the motherboard. 
So Ethernet has its own frames. I don't think we have any test questions on this, but I just wanted to include it just so you know. Looks pretty similar. You got a destination and a source. Looks looks very much like the other frames and packets you've seen. The concept is the same. Uh, Ethernet frame details. We're not worried about that at this juncture. So this is the important thing for this week. Building and maintaining network documentation. Know the lay of the land and diagram it. Now, if you built this network, you are going to take a piece of paper or Visio or draw.io or something. You know, some of you are just twisted and you insist on doing your network maps in Microsoft Paint. That's kind of sadistic to me. Like, you're just hurting yourself. And the end product looks gar like garbage. It's fine, though. Um, one, I don't. One of you in one of the sections when we did this actual exercise, you drew your whole map as just a bunch of potatoes connected, which is funny enough to get a passing grade, but don't do that. You want to draw the physical layout. You want to just draw it. Yeah, the person could be in the room, could just look at it themselves, could see it in person, but maybe they're not there in person. Or maybe it's faster to explain that you've got conduit run through the ceiling, through the floors, with a physical with a map that you drew of the physical layout draw the whole topology put ip addresses on there if they're static or put the range on the corner of the page name all your major devices describe it all give whoever's reading your map as much information as you possibly can okay um, protocols two yeah operating systems like oh over here two win 10 computers over here Wi-Fi router over here, copier, etc. Map it all out. If your map looks like this, that's not great. You say, oh, the, the internet comes in to our main router, which has a firewall that sort of protects us. Then we have a switch attached to that router, and then we have our workstations and our printer down here. Okay. Um, yeah, again, probably late at night when I made that slide. That's going to be my excuse. This is sort of a better description of what it's going to look like. This is an OK network map, but we don't see the building layout here. That's my problem with that one. More on that in a second. You want to get an actual layout of the building and draw your network map onto that. <clears throat> so this is going to provide a snapshot in time of the last time you made any changes to it, ideally. And no one will have come through and made any changes without documenting it, right? Right? You would never do that. So. Um, yeah, this is another one of the same type. This is like without the building. Okay. So what, normally we would take the quiz now, but it's on D2L. You guys can take it whenever you want. You guys have actually already done this lab. This I'm Again, I'm uploading this lecture for review. This is a map of our classroom. Sort of. There's a few computers over here. The teacher computer's over here. The screen's here. The door is here. And you can see what they've done. They've used an, a green wire to illustrate where the Ethernet runs. And they put a switch at these two corners where there are, in fact, switches in our room. It's completely accurate. The Wi-Fi is hanging on the ceiling in the center of the room. Can't see our big table here in the middle. But this is our classroom. This is a good network map. It's very simple. It doesn't include as much detail as you probably should. But it definitely very quickly and clearly gives you an idea of how the room is built. So you could look at this, and then I could say, walk into that room and show me where the switches are. And you would just instantly know where they are. Or there's a problem with one of the switches. You'd know where to check. So here is a more elaborate one, a little bit. You can see the backbone blue line is thicker. That's good. Indicates that this is probably going to a rack, a wiring closet. These little thin ones are the patch cables going to the individual devices. You can see that the printer and the scanner each have a line. Uh, and each room is labeled according to its purpose. The server room, the rack, that's all labeled. So just as a reminder, what we did in class was I broke you guys up into groups. Each of you got a building layout. And I said, I'm paying you to build me a network in this building. But first, I want you to draw me a map of where you're going to build it. Now, I want to know everything. I want to know where the horizontal cabling is, where the the uh, Wi-Fi routers are, where the patch cables are going to run, floor, ceiling, how are you going to hide it? And I gave you these maps, and you guys did really well. 
And then I tricked you and made you read each other's maps, which is really funny to me. I just love that part. But you did good. Your maps were intelligible, and the other groups were able to understand it. So, uh, thanks for coming to my TED Talk. There's your lecture that you already had in case you want it for review for the exam you're going to have next week. All of this is out of order because right now we're all quarantined because of coronavirus. And I hope you're all safe and uh, following the, uh, the rules, being very careful. Um, sounds like a, a horrible thing to get, so be smart. Avoid it. Avoid it. Do what they say. Okay. That's it. We'll see you next time.